Well, good evening. Glad you all are here. We are looking, this is our sixth lesson in the book of Daniel. We're looking in Daniel chapter 5. Sixth lesson, fifth chapter. Yeah, that's right. All right, so we got uh, almost to the end of our class last week. Uh, <clears throat> does anybody remember the storyline that we discussed last week from chapter 4? Yeah, that's uh, a good... How did he come to recognize the power of God? He went crazy. He went out of his mind. He had this dream, right, of this giant tree, uh, and this tree was chopped down, and it ate grass like the beasts of the field. And turns out Daniel interpreted that dream as himself, and it came true. And what happened... At least kind of led into that, what happened by the end of that chapter. How did all this work out? Yeah, he recognized God and God brought him back. And um, God showed one, one true th- thing. This was repeated three times <clears throat> throughout the chapter. What was the point? Yeah, Terry. Yeah, God rules in the kingdoms of men. That that was uh, the the underlying message there. And I had to probably hope to spend a little more time with application on this point, right? But um, not only did he give King Nebuchadnezzar the throne... He took it away and left it open for him to come back to. And I think if you understand the, the political, I don't understand, but I think if we understood the political uh, jockeying for power of this time, you, know, you have all these different uh, players, the Medes, the Persians, the Asians, the Chaldeans, there's a lot, uh, a lot going on and a lot of people who want power. Sorry about that. I guess I could hit the mute button. That would work better. Um, how does that how does that roll over into our life? Into our life. And. Yeah, I, th- I think that's, that's spot on. And if you miss that, uh, th- there's a lot going on in our world for us to get stressed about, to have anxiety about. And if we find ourselves dismayed, we can always remember God's in control. And is there anything else from that? I think that's, that's an excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. Chapter 4. Mm-hmm. Well, You're the I only had, one with your hand up. So. I, had tr- I had trouble hearing, but uh, the, the bottom line is I, I, I see where uh, Nebuchadnezzar essentially um, never listened to Daniel and respected the things that Jehovah God did. He has a dream. It's interpreted for him. And uh, he think, says God is great, and then he yeah, goes back away. <laughs> now he has another dream, and he goes crazy, and, uh, and he's restored, and he says God is great. But then, of course, then Belshazzar comes. Well, that's chapter 5. We'll get yeah, to that later. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and, and, and I think in our own lives, no matter what position we hold, whether great or small, God's put us there, yep. and God can take us out of it, right? Right. And... That should have been a pretty, uh, remember what, what, 
language this, was this portion of Daniel written in? Aramaic, so that it, it could be widely understood, right? And, and the point is, no matter, you know, no matter what uh, oppressor you're under, right, Brian, or maybe when we apply it to our own lives, no matter who you are, what you have and what you do not have, God can give and, and take away from, right? And that we're going to see this a little later on when Daniel uh, responds in chapter 5. Uh, you should have known better. The, the point of writing this was so that everyone understood God's in control over the big and the small. Any, any other thoughts there? I, I think that kind of lays some of the groundwork as we dig into the fifth chapter, but we didn't get them. Yeah, Lee. Well, two kind of questions. Who do you think the audio? I mean, when you say it's more accessible language-wise, who do you think's reading this besides the Jews, um, honestly? And secondly, in chapter four, it's odd that the first part of the chapter is Nebuchadnezzar. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing this. And mid-chapter, it changes to his. It changes to third person, and then like the last six verses are back to first person. Yeah, I, you, I just I find that interesting. I don't know why. I don't. Well, I don't know why I find it interesting. I don't know why it happens. Sure. Either. I mean, I I do think that that there's a clear uh, segregation of of language here, and the stories themselves speak to an audience that is much broader than just the nation of Israel. We we. Uh, I've talked a little bit about this. As you go back to the Hebrew, it's about God taking care of His people. This right. is not about that. But my and question is, who, who, would be, who would actually be the audience that, that the non-Hebrew language would be speaking to? Who do you think, I mean, and, and this goes back to the stories in, in Daniel, uh, you know, the, the condemnation of the nations. I, I, I just wonder, the nations aren't reading those books. Um, <laughs> The Chaldeans probably have no interest in reading Jewish history or understanding that their king has gone crazy. Um, I'm just, I mean, it's just. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, this, this person and his cohorts are the second, third, fourth, and fifth in command of the nation. What they write is probably read by many people, um, in, in the, in the, at least in the general vicinity. Yeah, Daniel. Come back with a wild speculation to sure. kick off for contribution. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, first of all, like a chapter like chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is writing it, so there would be people in Babylon interested in reading it. Um, so there's a wild speculation. It is interesting that when Jesus is born, wise men come from the east. Uh, that would be like Babylon, Chaldea. And you kind of think, like, why were there Chaldeans looking for and anticipating and reading the signs for the coming of somebody who was going to be born? Now, again... You're speculating to say, well, because of Daniel, but that's a, not a bad guess if you trace it back and say there was Hebrews at the top, top of the elites that were writing down things that were accessible to the people in Babylon who were clearly interested in learning because chapter one, they were all about teaching literature and reading things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you know, someone of influence in Babylon is going to write stuff that other people of influence in Babylon are going to be interested in and read yeah. about. If you look back at Zor Roster and his influence on religion, everyone was looking to know everything about every kind of God. Uh, and they were so afraid of missing the boat on, on the one they should have been bowing down to, they, they tried to pay homage uh, as roundabout as possible. Um, and that required knowing about them, and for sure. All right, so a little bit of a history lesson here. Uh, here we are, and okay, we've kind of talked about this already. I'm going to jump through this. Uh, th this is at the top of a lot of the, uh, the worksheets we give. I, I kind of zoomed in here to make it readable. You know, we've talked a lot about the captive waves. And uh, going back to Ezekiel, I have this on the slide. I may have to come back. Um, go, going back to Ezekiel here, our Ezekiel study, what were the three stages of the, the Babylonian captivity? Or the three different affronts on the, the nation? The three affronts on the nation of Israel. 
We talked about this a lot in Ezekiel. Well, it was idol worship in the temple. You're talking about the, the, the great sins? The Babylonians, they came in and they didn't do it all at once, right? There was three oh, stages. Three uh, deportations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first, basically, the king allowed certain people to go. The second one, it was a major deportation. And uh, the third, I think, was the... the um, Insiegement, the besiegement of the city, and the final destruction of the temple. Utter, utter destruction. How, how do we do, Daniel? Is that, is that pretty good summary from Ezekiel? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> That's all right. Uh, uh, and, and really, I think most people would accredit the exile to the second of those. And that, that kind of happens in 598 to 597. You know, that, that particular uh, offensive started in 598. 597, and it started off this whole chain of the 70 years that we read about in, in, in exile, right? And one thing that you've got to note, so if, you, if, if we think about Daniel, and I think I have this on another slide, but when we first meet him in chapter 1, how old is he? I can't imagine he's older than 18, maybe even as young, I mean, we're going to see him as an old man, man like 95 at the, at the youngest by the end of the book. So I, I can't imagine he was much older than 18, maybe 14. Could be wrong, maybe he lived to 120, but, I, but I, that's not the impression I get. And you can kind of see here in the, this first wave that happens, or the second wave that happens in 598, and now we've gone all the way, when we find ourselves in chapter 5, we're no longer talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar dies. There's a heir for a couple of years. His name is Evil Murdoch. Uh, I think Rick actually mentioned he might have been the pro temp, the interim king when he went crazy. I hadn't read that, but, but Rick mentioned that. Kind of a interesting. And then Nebuchadnezzar uh, comes onto the scene. He doesn't really like ruling all that much. And so he puts his son on the throne while he goes to vacation for 10 years in this land or that land. And, uh, and we, we read about him here, this Belshazzar, which sounds a lot like Belshazzar, the other name for Daniel. So let's not get that confused. We'll use Daniel for Daniel and Belshazzar for this, this king at this time. But as you can see, 60, 55, 60 years have passed maybe since the beginning of our book. And Daniel's not the young man. I don't know how old he was uh, since chapter 4, but it's been 30 or 40 years since chapter 4. A lot of time has passed uh, where we find ourselves. And, and all this is based around the, the ending verses that say that night Belshazzar lost the kingdom. And we know that happened in 539 B.C. In fact, we know the dates isn't this crazy? October 9th and 10th, 539 B.C. is when the Persian Empire to overtook uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire in the city of Babylon. It's pretty, pretty oddly specific for what we usually get in uh, the Old Testament. I'm not a history nerd, but even I think that's pretty geeky cool, right? Um, and so, Daniel's not the same person uh, as you can imagine. He's lived a life in a, a full life in exile at this point. All right. And let's go back to the city of Babylon for a few minutes. Um, Babylon has stood as an em empire. Maybe this ebbed and flowed as exactly who was in control, but for over a thousand years, there was no empires before it. This is all the world knew of a... Of a political imperial structure that, <clears throat> at this time. And were they a little bit successful or a lot bit, su bit successful? <clears throat> From all accounts, not just philosophy, uh, quadratic equations, accounting, laws, the Hammurabi Code is the first written law that we know of. I mean, on every affront, we see them pioneering the future of culture, the future of the way a nation is structured and run, economics, 
uh, a cool thing about this chapter is they know what gold is God's from this, the, the, the temple in Jerusalem, right? Which means there was accounting and there was record keeping and they could go and find this deposit to pull that out of. Think about that. Uh, out of, out of 60, 60 years later, they know exactly what this is and whose it was. Uh, the empire had even changed hands. It's not even the same dynasty anymore. You know, we find all this. The, uh, one of the seven wonders of the world was the gardens that supposedly Nebuchadnezzar built. And they were self-watering um, with different kind of aqueducts and things of that nature. Is this a, is this a rural, pagan, little dirt kingdom? They conquered the entire Middle East, yeah. And we'll look at it here. I don't know how accurate this is. This is the, the River Euphrates. Have we ever heard of this river before? Since, since the beginning, right? Um, and, you know, this is about 59 miles from Baghdad, if you're wondering. I think I read to the southeast of Baghdad. Um, there were, depending on how you look at it, there was two to three walls, some 100 meters high. Uh, some accounts say 200,000 people lived here. Some accounts say 2 million people lived here. Not what I think about as an ancient city, right? This was highly advanced, highly defended. And what history tells us is um, Cyrus the Great was the one who overthrew this, and his uh, father and mother, one was a Mede and one was a, a Persian. And it kind of made him the perfect person to come to power. Nobody liked that uh, Neb Nebunidus was uh, not on the throne. They, it was just a sour political environment. And the, everything was just ripe for an overthrow. And Cyrus the Great started to build this army and started conquering cities. And he comes up to the city of Babylon in 539, and, and if you are to align the account of the timeline in this chapter with anything in history, uh, he's here on the Outer Banks the night this feast is going on that we're about to read about. And they divert the river Euphrates into a marsh. This was one of their huge, you can see it surrounding the city in this picture. So one of their huge defensive mechanisms was this mighty river and they divert the water so that they can walk over, and they walk in without any confrontation. The, the, there is a Cyrus, the, the Cyrus Cylinder. It actually talks about a lot of things. It's where we read about in uh, that the Ezra got the gold to go back and build the temple. It's all, I mean, this is really a cool part of history because we start to see tangible, secular documents that corroborate these stories. And, and this Cyrus Cylinder says this very thing, that they just walked in and took over the city. Why? What were the people in this city doing? <laughs> All right, we'll dig into chapter 5 know. from here. I don't know. All right, so let's, let's read the first 10 verses here in Daniel chapter 5. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. They brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron, wood and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of all the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand and as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. 
Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not re- read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then, then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever, but not your thoughts alarm you, nor your color change. There's a young man, or there's a man in your kingdom who is the spirit of the, who, whom, with whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, Solved problems were found in this Daniel, who, whom the, the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the passage of time here. How old is Daniel uh, by, by the time we get to this story? Um, I mean, I think he's close to 80, right? He's, a, he's an old man. <laughs> What, what role has he played in these stories? I mean, the queen explains this, right? What's been his role in all of these stories? Interpret. In Daniel. Interpret mm-hmm. the dreams. Yeah, he's, a, he's an interpreter. He has wisdom. Yeah, Daniel. We talked about when uh, the chapter that correlates this, I get, or another chapter that's similar, uh, where he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 of him being like a Joseph figure, right, who comes in, no one can interpret the dream, he comes and interprets the dream. You see the same sort of thing here. What's ironic is, like, he's already proven himself to be a wise man and a great interpreter, but he's basically been forgotten about. He's like Joseph in the, in the prison, you know, not really because he still has a stat, you know, status, but it takes the queen mother to come in and say, hey, there's this guy who can help you, you know, his name's Daniel. So he fits that kind of Joseph mold again. Even though he's proven himself once, he's clearly not recognized, you know, at least by this king, as being mm-hmm. uh, a wise man. Yeah. For sure. Um, we've talked about it a little bit tonight, but how has he seen these other leaders behave? What's their general, what's their general trait? Humility, wisdom. They exalt themselves. They put themselves on a pedestal. They say... Literally, look what I've built, right? Uh, Christy brought up the Tower of Babel. I don't even think when she said that last week, I was thinking Babylon, like the, the layers here. Or, I mean, Ur, of, well, I mean, we're not far from Ur, the Chaldeans. These are people who spoke Semitic languages. You know, like all, all this is so connected, right? It's really, really interesting to, to lay that on top of this. Um, he's watched all these leaders come up, be full of themselves, get knocked down by God, and come up and be full of themselves again, right? Particularly Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to go ahead and do some wild speculation that over the last 35 years, he's seen seen these leaders be full of themselves, right? This isn't isn't something new, right? And so, you know, we kind of talked about this. I'll go back to some dates. The fall of Babylon, or the fall of Jerusalem, it was a little bit after, but the, the second, second besiegement when the exiles were taken to, into captivity was the besiegement started at 598 and it ended in 597. What is 70 years later? We're getting pretty close by the time we get to 539, right? So we're, we're well with it. our exiles. If they're looking to the prophecy, if they're looking to uh, the truth that God has laid out for them, they're getting... Uh, very anxious yeah. for what's about to come, right? They, they'll just light at the end of the tunnel. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Daniel. Because oh, I think you mentioned, and maybe we can get back to it at some point, not tonight or another class, about there's maybe multiple ways to count the 70 years. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, one way you think, okay, what you, this is 539, you said. Mm-hmm. Well, 605... When Nebuchadnezzar first showed up in Jerusalem and said, I'm taking your, you know, youths with me, kind of exerting himself, uh, that's almost exactly 70 years at 60-something, yep. you know, so 
uh, 70 years from the moment that Nebuchadnezzar walked into Jerusalem to you know, show himself is when Babylon finally falls. Yeah, and that's a great point. I, I can go, I, you can make so many arguments. What is the exact 70 years? I, it's kind of hard to, to pin down. But the cool thing is, no matter how you count it, there's something that happens 70 years later. You got these story Ezra and Nehemiah. And no matter what, what aspect you, you consider, uh, you can frame up to 70 years. So if the exiles are expecting something to happen from God, God has prophesied something. What do you think God, what, where's God's mind? He's about to do what? Restore his people, right? Restore the remnant, bring them back. That brings me to the, the next set of questions here. Um, so what is Belshazzar's mindset? Maybe we could say his council, maybe his party. Have, have we ever seen anything like this before? Probably hasn't happened yet in history, but we've studied about it here in the last two years. A party like this? Does this ring any bells? The story of Esther. Very good. Uh, Xerxes and, and his party. In fact, uh, he's about to go to war and he throws this big party. Here we're at the end of this war. The, the Persians are on their doorstep and they throw this big party. Is it a small one? Is it an intimate affair? Hey, thank you for all you've contributed, my few... Uh, Loyal subjects, my, my, my closest advisors. Is that what we see going? It's a thousand employee drunken party, right? This is, this is, this is the king's big deal, right? Um, what does that say about him? Same thing all these leaders said. Pumped up ego, it's all about them. Uh, you know, using a lot of good judgment, getting junk, drunk while the Persians are imagine they're within a week's walk. Are you going to get drunk with a thousand of your top leaders in the kingdom? Probably not. You know, like, it just doesn't show a lot of good judgment. It shows a lot of pomp and a lot of um, arrogance, right? And what did they use at this party? Kind of already alluded to this, but what did they use at this party? Yeah, Brian. Silver and gold and they defiled, basically they defiled the temple uh, instruments and elements, used the vessels to drink from, everything used in the temple they already did. Yeah, speak to that. What, what about those vessels in the temple? Are they just <laughs> ornamental gold cups? No, they're used to worship God. They're used to worship God. They're, they're sanctified, they're holy and set apart. And not only do they use them to have this right, this loud, obnoxious party, what else do they use them to do specifically? Praise their own God. So here are the things that are set apart, that are holy for the service and worship of God the Almighty. They take them in their arrogance as their own, use them for vile things, and go and worship gods who do nothing. I don't know that I've ever, uh, I've ever thought through that, that so, as much as I have this week. Um, I mean, that's a pretty big finger in the eye <clears throat> to a people who have been shown God directly in a very obvious way over and over. Any, any comments about that? Yeah, Wendy. Wendy. The statue from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That's an interesting dream. point. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about the wood, was, but uh, generally speaking, the, the, there's some element here of, of the succession of, of what the kingdoms of men look like. I think that, that's probably a, a good tie in there, Wendy. Anything? Yes, Daniel. Back to what Lisa said earlier, I meant. I do think that these things would have been read, but Lee's point, I think part of it at least, is that like they're not really going to like accept it or yeah. And this, this so this story makes that point that like mm -hmm. even yeah. though they had seen things, like seeing it and being exposed to it or reading it or hearing about it is a very different thing from taking it to heart and learning from it. You know that kind of thing. Uh, which you know to, to his point from earlier, uh, clearly these things were not 
read, dispersed, and acted upon in, in wide scale, right? Uh, you see here, you know, these sto the stories would have been known. They saw what God did on various occasions, but it doesn't, doesn't mean this is true. Yeah, and Nebuchadnezzar's madness and his restitution was 40 years ago. They were probably very much a religion of the month club uh, concept. I, I, that's true. So, what do we say God's ready to do? Free his people, build his temple, send his, goal, his, his holy instruments back. Do you think Belshazzar is looking like he's very humble and willing to give that gold to go back to the temple in this? Probably not. <laughs> he's not even thinking about releasing them. And he's basically saying, this is mine to do with as I please, right? We're, we're within a year, maybe five years, to Daniel's point, how you're going to look at exactly how many years of the 70 we're, we're through. Um, flip over with me. Uh, somebody read Ezra 1 and 2. We'll get uh, Dan to go with a, a mic. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 and verse 7. 1, 2, and 7 from chapter 1. That's, that's right. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And skipping down to verse 7. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed them in the house of his gods. One year later, the first year, right? One year later, Cyrus, and, and we read this again on that Cyrus cylinder, he uh, wanted to show respect to the people of the empire, and he returned all um, exiles to their country. It wasn't just the Jews. He returned all exiles. This was a man whose, uh, whose intentions was to do this, and God was going to use him in that way. God, God looked at this party of Belshazzar's and said, you're not going to do what I want you to do. One year later, you know, we'll talk about maybe Cyrus and uh, Daniel calls him uh, Darius, but the timeline suggests this is one year later. And we see that this gold gets to go back, which I can't help but think God was watching this party and saying, I control this. I'm in charge of this. It's not going to be the Neo-Babylonian Empire that sends my people back. In fact, we know that from how many chapters of Isaiah? Uh, probably two, maybe a dozen that, that talk about the downfall of that and it wouldn't be them. I think there's even some language in there that suggests they wouldn't even put up a fight, which that story of how the Persians came in and took over that night, it's, it's all very cool uh, how this starts to tie. Any, any thoughts about that? This party, these vessels, this, it wasn't just some, uh, some arrogant heart. There was, I think there was something much greater going on here. Yes, yeah, Steve. Okay, and uh, the king had to sit there and look at what he already knew. I mean, I mean, I feel strongly by the fact that he knew. He acted like he didn't know, but, know, but he knew. And he got an instant replay. And it just reminds me of, of uh, Romans chapter 1. Uh, that, that attitude of arrogance, that attitude of putting yourself uh, in the position uh, of God or or power or might or uh, whatever and, and not having a humble attitude towards uh, God Almighty. That doesn't work in any uh, in any nation, any tribe, any it doesn't work. Uh, God Almighty reigns and his will will always be accomplished. 
regardless of what king That's or right. what uh, country or what time you live in. And it should give us, uh, I think it should give us hope. That's an expectation sure. of, uh, of the fact that, you know, as his children, if we don't lift ourselves up against him, humble ourselves before him, uh, we're going to be okay. Great point. Anything else there? We've spent 40 minutes on half the verses. Uh, so, okay, let's, let's get to the rest of this chapter real quick, starting in verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of, one of the exiles of Judah, whom my, the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard that you... Sorry. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing, to make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Remember, his father was vacationing for 10 years, and he couldn't give any higher than three, right? Because he was only the second. <clears throat> and because of the great... I lost my place here, I'm sorry. Y'all. And because of the greatness that he gave him, and all people, nations, and language trem- tremble before him. I, I've, I've jumped ahead. Uh, but starting in verse 19... We only have four minutes. I'm so sorry. but And because of the greatness that he gave him and all the peoples and nations and languages trembled before him, whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he would be humbled. But when the, his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast. And his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of of silver and gold, of bronze, of iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the gods in whom, whose hands is your breath, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and the writing was inscribed. And this was the writing that was inscribed. Many, many, tekel and parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Many, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and have brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Persian, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple and a chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the child. Chaldean was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So what do we see here? How was Daniel? I think this is the part I I jumped over. But Daniel, was he excited about the gifts? Why why would he not be? I think I think think of a couple reasons, but yeah, Brian. Doesn't need them, doesn't want them. It's, it's worthless anyways because it's all over tonight, right? <laughs> he's got nothing to give, and I'd say he's gotten it before. Um, is that the second bell? Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Um, so who called, who called for Daniel in this story? The queen, not even the king. And, and after what? We've seen this over and over, right? The wise men. Can't even tell the message, let alone tell the interpretation. And uh, Daniel comes in. What happened in the last chapter when Daniel came in?
How did he approach the king in chapter 4? Was it a popular vision? Was it going to be well received? But how did, what, what did he say? May this dream and its interpretation be for the king's enemies. I, I don't want this. He was using some political savvy, some, yeah, uh, maybe looking out for himself a little bit. But in this chapter, what do we find? Yeah, like, I don't want your stuff, but I'll tell you what this means, right? And, and maybe he was, he was so into, uh, into what was going on on the political stage. Maybe he was out looking at the Persian army crossing over the river. Wild speculation here, again. Uh, he knew he didn't have to really um, build this up. And, and I think it's so funny uh, the irony that he gets the robe and the chain at the end of the end of the story, anyways. And how long did that last? Uh, you know, maybe six hours. <laughs> uh, and this won't be the last time either, right? That we see some something like this come for Daniel. But what's what's the message? Yeah. <laughs> Christy says, your days are numbered, found lacking, bye. Uh, I like that, it's distinct. Um, yeah, it does say who's going to take the kingdom. What does it say about, you know, when I think about chapter 4 and Nebuchadnezzar's attitude, it was all about himself, right? But was it really, a, obviously if you're for yourself, you're against God. Was he really anti jehovah in that story, not really. What do we see here? Yeah. Yeah, you, you are against God, Daniel says. Uh, arrogance, hubris, that's all. And I would, I would go on to say, this is it. I think there's something else here when we look at Ezra. I don't think it's just he happened to pull out this account out of the bank that night, right? I think, um, I think there's definitely something more intentional going on uh, and in a way that suggests he would not do what God wanted him to do when it came time to return the people of Israel. He was, uh, he was an operative against God. And that very night, as Michelle pointed out, what happened? He lost his kingdom. Darius the Mede come, Darius, Darius uh, comes on to play. I, I'm of the opinion, of the uneducated opinion, that this is, Cyrus the Great is this Darius. I don't know how, I don't know how to read uh, something different than that if uh, we take this, these dates literally that very night. Um, and, and some of the ages and things tend to work out this way. And we see a new chapter. Okay, I mean, almost immediately you're into Ezra. Um, Daniel's not over. The book of Daniel's not over. Think about that for a second. A year later, we're into the book of Ezra, and Daniel's got years of counsel to go. I mean, we're in chapter 6 of, of 12, right? or chapter 5 of 12. Um, which is, I do you ever think about how long Daniel lived? That was kind of one of the points of our early timeline, right? Is he spanned this whole period and was operating at the top of every kingdom that was operating uh, at that time, which is another act of who? The direct act of God. God put him in power. Just the same as he did all these other kings. He was putting Daniel in these positions of um, where he could influence these things. And I think it probably had an influence on the kings, as, especially as we see uh, Xerxes and uh, the, the various Cyrus and Darius characters come about over the next couple of years and how well they treat the, the people of Israel. You've got to think Daniel had an influence on that, right? He's sitting there second, third, fourth in command over and over, uh, and then these same kings do th good things for the nation. And I think that's, that's very telling. Again, I, I, I missed the application point. Any other thoughts, though, uh, before we close on this? Lesson. God's in control. He can bring down mighty empires with, without any bloodshed, maybe. All right. Thanks for your attention.